what I'm going to just try to tell you is probably something that you already know. Uh, I'm going to say it both for the FMA and the AFA that uh, what you probably want to do is you want to send your applications kind of by early September if you haven't already done so. I guess in this case, if it's the uh, AFA, it's going to be early November. Uh, and then give or take a month later is when you're going to start to hear back and you're going to start kind of scheduling interviews. The interviews are going to happen right around the conference, be it the FMA or the AFA. Uh, I know that there has been kind of a seismic shift since I went on the market where a lot of these early stage interviews are now conducted via Zoom. So you're probably already experienced in that or have already experienced that for those of you that are already on the market. But that's uh, kind of something to keep in mind. And then uh, there might be a second round interview uh, in some cases, but uh, eventually, hopefully, you get into the flyout stage and you actually go and you do your flyouts, and I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that. So I think this just kind of helps with this timeline. I think the most important way to approach it is to always work backwards from this timeline. Kind of know exactly when you have to have everything done and kind of do the necessary maths to get you back to where you should start, uh, when should you have kind of your milestones, if you will, and how you're gonna hit all of those milestones. So the two big things that I think are basically kind of number one and number two in your application packet are your job market paper and recommendation letters. So those are the two things you should focus the most attention on. So for your job market paper, uh, if you are a second year or a third year, you should literally plan ahead and plan ahead with that timeline that I just, just gave you in mind. Uh, so make sure that you're gonna have a version of your paper that is complete, well edited, uh, your committee has kind of signed off on it in a sense, they've given you feedback about it, you've incorporated all of that feedback, all of that takes time and you wanna be basically very, very careful because that could, dis that could determine whether you go on the market this year or next year um, or um, kind of make different, uh, different decisions. So make sure that you do that. And, and please, uh, I'm a non-native English speaker. I struggle with this just like everyone else. I think Amit mentioned this about writing. I think it's very important that your paper is very polished and very well edited. I think that's a it's very hard for people to look at your paper, try to read your abstract, and not understand what you're doing because of uh, kind of improper use of the language. Uh, and that's a very easy thing to get over. Just get someone else to look it over uh, if, if you have uh, any problems with it. And also, I think, like I said, your advisor and your committee uh, as a whole is very instrumental, but your advisor most, more important, most important of all. So make sure that you work with them that they approve the list of schools that you're going to apply to, that uh, they kind of bless everything along the way. Don't kind of spring up everything on them at the last minute. Uh, your advisor, he or she, is going to have kind of their different way of approaching things. But again, make sure that this is your career, not necessarily theirs. They have every incentive to help you, but you have to be driving kind of this train. Uh, you have to be the engine that moves everything along. And you need to make sure that you get the letters done on time, that uh, you get the school list done on time, that you send the applications on time, that everything is kind of professionally done. Now, <laughs> hoping that you've done all of those things right, then comes the interviews. For some of you, this is maybe tomorrow. Uh, and what you want to do is realize that some of them are gonna be via Zoom, and there is a different dynamic. I personally struggle with talking on Zoom. Uh, as you can see, I walk around, I move my hands. A lot harder to do on Zoom. Um, <clears throat> I think that the best way to prepare is to practice. Uh, I think it's, especially with Zoom, you can actually just record yourself and see how you do. Uh, make sure that you are comfortable kind of in, in your own skin. So the interviews are gonna be uh, kind of an opportunity for you to kind of talk and sell your research. But I think the part that you probably haven't heard, maybe you did hear it, is that this is an opportunity to sell yourself. So 
I think I'm going to repeat some of the advice that you got earlier, which is you should be enthusiastic about your work, right? But I think it's just as important to make sure that everyone realizes. I mean, these people are evaluating you, and this is one of the criteria that they're evaluating you on. Are you enthusiastic about your work? I think you should show it. Uh, don't, don't, kind of don't half-heartedly give your pitch. Make sure that you, you know, you're a little bit excited about it. <clears throat> and you are selling yourself, and try to be yourself, but I would qualify that and say, try to be the best version of yourself that you can put forward in an interview. I know it, it sounds disingenuous, but I think a lot of people are assuming that you're going to do, you know, you're going to put forth the best person, uh, version of yourself. So I think that's what you should, what you should aim for. Uh, and that's basically kind of going to give them an honest assessment of you. Uh, because you want there to be a good fit between you and the school. <clears throat> I think this is the best way to achieve that. Uh, because that's precisely what everyone else uh, is expecting. And, and also kind of be prepared to talk outside of your job market paper. Uh, anything on your CV, anything in your background could come up. And I think you, you want to be prepared for those things. Don't be blindsided <coughs> that someone asks you something about the second paper on your CV. Uh, I think that's completely fair game, and uh, in all likelihood, it is going to come up. Maybe, now, maybe I'll cut in, if you allow me. No, absolutely. So, they're hiring colleagues, they're not hiring papers, so smile. <laughs> this is, you know, look like you're somebody that they would like to get in the room next to themselves. That also includes when they want to talk about their paper, you sort of engage with them and say, oh, you know, this is interesting, this is fantastic. You know, wow, well, one could do this, and one could do Think about you being hired as a colleague. You're not being hired as a paper. What does it take to be hired as a colleague? Who will be for five years in my office next door? So, yeah. no, I'll, I'll cut in two no, more. Uh, on the same note, read who the people were interviewing. It's so easy today. When we were in the job market, you had to look up things and so on. Today, you Google the department, you look who these people are. I can tell you that I was surprised in some cases when we were interviewing candidates. And Kansas didn't know anything about the research of several of the people who were in the room. They were like, how come? What is that? And it's really, it's insulting. It just means they don't do their homework. And you know, you may be able to raise questions that will create a connection. So you say, for example, oh, Aubrey, I see you've been working on this, you know, theater, and I have this great idea. It's not in my job market, but I'm thinking about it. So you create a connection immediately. So I think that's something that also should be added to the same point that even yeah. we're talking about. No, absolutely. I, I think these are all, uh, I'm, I'm probably not going to go in as much detail. There's a lot of this advice out there that you can probably seek on your own and kind of formulate what, what you think works best for you. So one of those pieces of advice that I always thought was a very useful thing, and it's very practical, is when you are practicing your pitch or when you are formulating your pitch, I think that you should build it as a pyramid. Uh, of course, this is a matter of style, and each person has their own style. But here's the idea that I like. It's, you can think of it as a pyramid or concentric circles. And the idea is that you want kind of a one minute, a five minute, and a 10, 15 minute pitch, or versions of the pitch. And they should kind of flow into each other somewhat seamlessly. That some people are going to ask you one question, and they're going to be expecting kind of a one minute answer. And you should have that somewhat ready. You should have thought about exactly what you do, how you do it, why is it important. All of the elements that I, I think uh, Effie mentioned earlier, you should have those and you should be able to express those succinctly and clearly and have it not something that's going to take you, you know, two minutes to think of on the fly. This is not the top time to do that. And then every now and then the conversation is going to stall and people are going to expect you to expand on those things or they might even ask you to expand on what you just said. So have that next five minutes kind of, again, ready, all of the statements, everything, you've organized it in your head uh, so that you are able to talk about it and communicate it clearly. And then eventually, if, if it takes 15 minutes to explain all of the elements of your paper, 
then you should, again, be able uh, to do so. And again, this is kind of a theme that I'm going to repeat a couple of times. I think that practice makes perfect. And I think that for some people, this is natural. They do it the first time, and it's perfect. But I think for the other 99.99% uh, of the people, this is not natural. You don't think in that kind of structured way and be able to express yourself in that structured way. So practice it and make sure that you're able to remember all of the points that you wanted to get across, that you're using the proper language, that you're using the, the, the right nomenclature. All of that uh, you can do on your own and be kind of what, somewhat more ready than you would do if this is the first time that you do it. Start, and then, start with explaining it to your mother. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's what I do. Well, I think Aubrey said. I think Aubrey said. You know, if you have a spouse or someone that's intelligent but not in the field, if you're able to explain it to them, I think you're going to be able to explain it to people in the field a lot better. And also, it's a litmus test of is it interesting or what elements of it are interesting that you should highlight. I mean, you can't read 50 pages to people on on a flyout or an interview or anything. So. You have to think of what is kind of the, the one sentence or the two sentences that summarize what I do. Uh, and that's a great way to do that. So about the last thing that I'm going to talk about is hopefully through all of these things, now you're at the flyout stage. And you are on a campus visit, say. Uh, now, of course, uh, I mentioned this earlier. Some schools now have these mini interviews in between. Um, I don't know if that's something that you will experience or not, but what they're now expecting you is to do a Zoom meeting where you do like a 15-minute presentation. Uh, again, the kind of the skills to do an in-person visit and doing these mini uh, presentations might not be completely overlapping. Uh, and again, just practice it. Make sure that you 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 have all of that kind of uh, ready and you're not taken by surprise because a lot of the time. These things are scheduled like a week in advance or even less than that. So you want to make sure that you at least have thought about it and maybe even have prepared some slides for it. And I personally think that this is something that a lot of people, at least I didn't believe this advice while I was on the job market, is that your flyouts are an excellent opportunity. It's an excellent opportunity for a lot of people to talk about your research. That doesn't happen often on the other side, and I'm going to talk about the other side in a, in a bit. Um, what you want to do is use that as an opportunity to kind of learn about the strengths and weaknesses of your own research. This kind of is in line with a lot of the uh, advice that you were just receiving, that you should be seeking advice all the time. You should be seeking feedback all the time. And this is just another opportunity to do so. Think of it as an opportunity, not this is this bad thing that I have to do to get a job. I think that you should view it as an opportunity. I'm going to go visit a campus, figure out if it's the perfect fit for me, figure out if this is the right place where I want to be, um, and use that to kind of get feedback, not only on your research, but also uh, gather information about the place that you're uh, about to visit. All right, so let me cut in here. The profession is long as Eva and I uh, exemplify. It could be a very long career. So uh, what Murad said is perfectly true. I mean, you meet a lot of people when you do the job market. You may not get a job with them, but who knows, like five years later, ten years later, you might, they want, may want a job in the university where you are, or you may want to switch jobs, or you want to visit, or whatever, and then they'll know who you are. So view it as an opportunity to meet people, to talk about your work, and uh, you know get an introduction to the profession. Yeah, uh, and, uh, kind of the, uh, another piece of general advice, kind of in line with what Aubrey just said, is that every talk that you give is a job talk in a sense, right? Uh, th there are there are always kind of these people that you're meeting and you're presenting your work to probably for the first time, and this is kind of a window into your world that they get to see you in, uh, and then. I, I mentioned this earlier about the interview, but I'm going to say it about the job market paper and the job market presentations as well, is that a lot of people are expecting that this is the thing that you spent five years, maybe six years working on, that this is your best work. This is a reflection of kind of your best self. 
So you should approach it with that type of expectation that this is not kind of a, an average run of the mill idea that you just came up with the other day. This is something that you've spent a significant amount of time thinking about, thinking thoroughly about, you've gotten advice from your advisors and your committee members about, and uh, all sorts of people have given you advice and you've internalized all of that advice. So make sure that you treat it as such. And again, I think there, there, is, there is always gonna be an element of the more you practice it, the better you're gonna get at it. <clears throat> I do believe that you're gonna eventually miss your PhD years. It might, you, I know you don't believe me, uh, <laughs> but, the, the grass is definitely not greener on the other side. I think just about everyone, and I'm going to ask people here, the first year as an assistant professor is probably your worst year. Um, you're in a new environment. Uh, you don't have your advisors to lean on. Uh, you have to teach. You have to prepare new stuff. You have to be on committees. You have to do all sorts of things that, honestly, you were not prepared to do, like, ever and you're having to do them the first time, but you also still have all of the research and all of those responsibilities. So just think of where you are now, at now, but more responsibilities got added, yet you just moved to a new environment and you have to uh, do all of the adaptation uh, there. You do get more money and I'll tell you this. Yeah, yeah, so you, you do get more money. <laughs> you do eat better. Uh, that's, that's the one thing. Uh, if, uh, if you're used to eating kind of ramen noodle or sandwiches or something like that, you can skip that if you choose. Uh, it's typically a little bit harder for you, like that consumption smoothing. You, you don't do it as well in the first year, but um, you, you, you actually uh, end up in that situation. I think you should enjoy uh, your, your time as a PhD student. I think you should try to finish your job market paper probably the, the summer after you get a job. Is a great time to actually kind of uh, finish a lot of that off as opposed to waiting until you move to the next institution. Um, because again, once you move, there are just a lot of new challenges. And uh, believe me, you just are not gonna have the time to spend as much as you do now on, uh, on, on your research uh, as you will in the future. <laughs> it is a stressful time. I totally agree. I totally understand that. I know that this is this is something that's going to determine the rest of your of your life. This is going to be your career. Uh, I think there were a lot of uh, questions that came up. Is this even the right career to, to, to choose? So this is a very stressful time. But I, again, I think if you just fixate on, I, I just need to get this thing done, get this thing done, you're just not going to enjoy the, the, the process. Uh, and like I said, this is one, one, going to be one of the few times where a lot of people are interested in your research, giving you feedback, um, you're having kind of these intellectual conversations. I think that's why we are all in this profession, is because we enjoy that type of kind of back and forth. So I think that you should take advantage of that and uh, make sure that you enjoy the process as much as you possibly can. Uh, I know that there are a lot of other things that I could say, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop here.